Welcome to our webinar, Complying with PACA. This presentation will last about 45 minutes, and a recording of the webinar will be available on the Wagner Law Group website, and you can access previous webinars on the website as well. Let me introduce our presenter, Marsha Wagner. Marsha is a specialist in pension and employee benefits law and is the principal of the Wagner Law Group, one of the nation's largest boutique law firms specializing in ERISA, employee benefits, and executive compensation. She founded the firm in 1996. A summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Cornell University and a graduate of the Harvard Law School, Marsha has practiced law for over 26 years. She is recognized as an expert in a variety of employee benefits issues and executive compensation matters, including qualified and non-qualified retirement plans, all forms of deferred compensation and welfare benefit arrangements. Marsha was appointed to the IRS Tax Exempt and Government Entities Advisory Committee and ended her three-year term as the chair of its Employee Plan Subcommittee and received the IRS's Commissioner's Award. She has also been inducted as a fellow of the American College of Employee Benefits Council. For the past five years, 401k Wire has listed Marcia as one of its 100 most influential persons in the 401k industry. She has received the Top Women of Law Award in Massachusetts and is listed among the top 25 attorneys in New England by the Boston Business Journal. She has written hundreds of articles and 13 books about retirement and benefit plans. She is widely quoted in business publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Pension and Investments, as well as many others. And she has been a frequent guest on Fox Business, CNN, Bloomberg, NBC, and other televised media outlets. Welcome, Marcia. Thank you so much. Please, slide number three. So President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law on March 23, 2010. The law was almost immediately amended by the Health Care and Education Affordability Reconciliation Act of 2010. The law is called by various names, including PAPACA, the Affordable Care Act, Health Care Reform, and even Obamacare. PAPACA is intended to increase the transparency and the efficiency of the country's health insurance markets while substantially decreasing the number of uninsured persons in the country. This is to be accomplished in part by mandating health care coverage for individuals and providing subsidies to lower income individuals and families. In addition, PAPACA imposes an assortment of new taxes and fees on individuals, employers, and health care insurers alike, and imposes new responsibilities on employers and insurers, as well as government programs such as Medicare and Medicaid. Employers of all sizes have found themselves subject to the new rules, regulations, and penalties. They have been required to make substantial changes to their group health plans designs, as well as summary plan descriptions and other employee benefit communications. Additional provisions of PAPACA will become effective in 2014. However, in order to assure compliance with PAPACA that we will be discussing shortly, you first must look to see if you are in compliance with a far older law, ERISA. Slide 4, please. The employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, which goes by the acronym ERISA, is a federal law that sets the minimum standards for retirement and welfare benefit plans sponsored by private employers. ERISA does not itself require employers to establish retirement or health benefit plans. It only requires that those employers who do establish such plans must meet certain minimum criteria and standards. ERISA covers retirement, health, and other welfare benefits, such as life, disability, and apprenticeship plans. Among other things, 
ERISA requires individuals who manage plans and other fiduciaries to meet certain standards of conduct. ERISA also contains provisions which obligate covered plans to satisfy governmental reporting and disclosure requirements. In addition, the law contains provisions aimed at assuring that plan funds are protected and that participants who qualify actually receive benefits. ERISA has been expanded to include new health laws. The Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1985, or COBRA, amended ERISA to provide for the continuation of health care coverage for employees and their beneficiaries. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, amended ERISA to make health care coverage more portable, portable and secure for employees. Most recently, PAPACA amended ERISA and other laws in an attempt to reduce the number of uninsured Americans and decrease overall health care costs. Slide 5, please. Now, ERISA requires all welfare benefit plans to have a plan document which contains certain provisions. Now, a plan document is way more than just insurance contracts. A plan document or a wrap document usually incorporates the insurance contracts by reference and provides the ERISA mandated provisions as follows. Named fiduciaries. An ERISA plan document must name one or more fiduciaries that have the authority to control and manage the operation and the administration of the plan. Allocation of responsibilities. The plan document must include a procedure for allocating responsibilities for plan administration and operation. Funding policy. Plans that are unfunded with benefits that are paid solely from the employer's general assets as opposed to a trust or insurance are not required to have a funding policy. For those of you on the call with VBIS, you do in fact need a funding policy. Benefit payments. Plan documents must state the basis on which benefits are to be paid from the plan. Claims procedures. The plan, summary plan description, or other written document must have a specific written procedure for processing claims and appeals that comply strictly with Department of Labor regulations. Amendment procedures. The plan document must contain an amendment procedure. It should be noted that a provision allowing the employer to amend the plan is frequently not included in an insurance contract. Protection of protected health information, or PHI. Under HIPAA, Many group health plan documents must include language that provides for non-disclosure and protection of PHI or protected health information. In addition, without a plan document, there is an incomplete record of how the plan is to be administered, leaving the decisions of the plan sponsor open to challenge by participants. The existence of a complete plan document change this by creating an assumption that the plan was administered in accordance with its terms, adding a layer of important protection to plan administrative decisions. Next slide, slide number six, please. Now, many employers assume that insurance contracts for fully insured product are written plan documents. Insurance companies, however, draft their contracts to comply with state insurance laws and do not have as a result, and are not intended to have as a result, many of the required or recommended provisions that are needed in an ERISA plan. Therefore, Wagner Law Group recommends that all welfare plans that do not yet have ERISA-required plan documentation create a wrap plan document to comply not only with ERISA, but with PAPACA as well. And a wrap plan document is designed to meet 
the plan documentation requirements of all of the various laws and provide additional legal protection for the employer and plan fiduciaries and simplify plan administration. For example, once a RAP document is adopted, an employer will not only be in compliance with ERISA and PAPACA, it will also document the fact that it is required to only file a single Form 5500 for all of its health and welfare plans, as opposed to a special 5500 for each of its welfare benefit programs, LTD, STD, health, life, etc. Next slide, slide number seven, please. One of the most important documents that plan participants are entitled to receive is the Summary Plan Description, or SPD. ERISA requires plan administrators to furnish SPDs to plan participants free of charge. The SPD will explain to participants what the plan provides and how it operates. While insurers provide certificates or booklets detailing much of this information, these documents do not comply with ERISA because they lack certain information that ERISA requires a plan administrator to provide in an ERISA SPD. For example, information typically missing from these benefit booklets include the plan number, the funding mechanism of the plan, the employer identification number, service of legal process, and the ERISA statement of rights. An incomplete SPD can subject plan administrators to significant penalties for noncompliance if they are unable to distribute a legally compliant SPD to plan participants in a timely manner. Next slide, please, slide number eight. Many employers often assume that materials provided by their insurance companies or TPAs, third-party administrators, do in fact qualify as SPDs. However, as with planned documents, these materials are often missing, required in important language that should be in an SPD. For example, again, such as eligibility requirements, COBRA information, qualified medical child support information, claims procedures, employer's right to amend the plan, etc. To avoid any potential compliance problems, employers that rely on materials provided by insurance carriers or, S or TPAs should also use RAP SPDs. RAP SPDs enable employers to add the required or recommended language to benefit descriptions in a certificate of coverage or benefits booklet in order to create a complete in legally compliant SPD. This has all become much more important in light of PAPACA or healthcare reform. Next slide, please slide number nine. ERISA requires health and welfare plan administrators to file annual forms called 5500 with the DOL following the close of each plan year. In particular, Forms 5500 contain information about insurance premiums, broker fees, and commissions paid by the plan. Form 5500s also really do report about the financial information and health of the plan. Group health plans with fewer than 100 participants that are fully insured are exempt from this requirement. However, plans that are not exempt with 100 or more participants are required to file these forms and if not are subject to penalties that can go up to $1,100 per day. Next slide, please. Plan administrators of employee benefit plans that fail to timely file Forms 5500 may, however, avail themselves of the Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance, or DFEC, program. DOL uses DFEC to encourage plan administrators to file overdue, incomplete, or incorrect Forms 5500 by offering reduced civil penalties 
is kind of like the carrot and the stick. The DOL typically assesses plan administrators are discovered as having filed late Forms 5500 without using DFEC, otherwise known as late filers, a $50 per day penalty was really no limit for the period during which they failed to file. Moreover, the DOL typically assesses plan administrators that have not filed a required Form 5500, also known as non-filers, a penalty of $300 a day, up to $30,000 a year, until a complete 5500 is filed. And remember, that is for each plan, short-term disability, long-term disability, dental, vision, health, et cetera. It can add up quickly. In the case of a plan with fewer than 100 participants at the beginning of the year, the penalty under DFEC program is $10 a day, not to exceed $750 per form 5500 and $1,500 per plan. And for larger plans, the annual report maximum is $2,000 per form 5500, not to exceed $4,000 per plan. While the, DOA, the DFBC program does not directly provide relief from late Form 5500 filing penalties under the Internal Revenue Code, the IRS has essentially acquiesced to the sanctions under DOL as being full and complete. Next slide, please. Slide 11. In general, Plan administrators are eligible for relief under DFVC if they comply with the program's requirements before receiving written notice from the DOL of the Form 5500 filing being late or failing in some respect. Applicable requirements include of the DFVC program that all Forms 5500 must be filed electronically using the ERISA filing acceptance system known as EFAS2, and filers must use specified plan year forms and schedules when filing under DFVC. Because of these complexities, delinquent filer submissions really should be made under the guidance of ERISA counsel. Next slide, please. Slide number 12. After ensuring that you have complied with the basic documentation and reporting requirements of ERISA, it is time to look at PEPACA compliance. By now, you or your staff are probably somewhat familiar with the basics and the provisions that required your immediate attention. For example, by now you should have already determined if your plan has grandfather status. Extended coverage to adult children up to age 26. Removed any lifetime benefits from your plans that, if necessary, increased or eliminated annual limits for essential health benefits. And held special open enrollment periods for those dependents who aged out of the plan and for any participant or beneficiary who had previously hit lifetime limits under previous or prior plan provisions. Next slide, please, slide 13. In addition, your group health plan or group insurance contract should have been amended to include applicable provisions of PAPACA. These amendments would include eliminating health care flexible spending account and health reimbursement account reimbursements for over-the-counter medications with the exception of insulin, making health care coverage available to children of plan participants until they reach age 26, eliminating lifetime limits and annual limits on essential health benefits with certain exceptions for grandfathered plans. Hold that thought. We will deal with that momentarily. And revising your claims procedure to comply with the new PAPACA rules. The effective date for most of these provisions was the first day of the plan year 
beginning on or after September 23, 2010. January 1, 2011 for calendar plan years. If you have not made any of these required amendments in your plans or your SPDs, you should contact ERISA Council immediately. Next slide, please, slide 14. One additional note before we leave the early compliance requirements under PAPACA. Effective as of January 1, 2011, health flexible spending accounts, as well as health reimbursement accounts, can no longer reimburse employees for over-the-counter medications except insulin unless the individual obtains a prescription for the drug or medicine. However, they may continue to reimburse employees for over-the-counter items that are not drugs or medicine, for example, crutches bandages, blood sugar tests, or contact lens solution are still reimbursable if they qualify as medical care. Therefore, your plan should have been amended to reflect this new rule. While we are on the subject of these reimbursement plans, it should also be noted that reimbursements from an FSA or HRA are now permitted for health care expenses of the employee of the employee's children until the end of the year in which the child would turn age 26, regardless as to whether or not the child would qualify as the employee's tax dependent. Next slide, please, or slide 15. If plan documents have been properly amended, the next step in complying with PAPACA involved the distribution of one or more required notices to plan participants and other individuals. These notices include the following. The grandfathered health plan notice, which is a notice stating that the employer believes its group health plan is grandfathered and therefore not subject to various provisions of PAPACA. Special employee enrollment notice for certain children who aged out which is a notice that the group health plan will cover children of participants until age 26 and that there will be or should have been a one-day, a one-time, 30-day open enrollment for adult children who currently were not covered under the plan but could have been so. Lifetime limits notice, which is a notice that the lifetime limits of the group health plan are not applicable anymore and that a one-time 30-day open enrollment opportunity will be or should have been available to participants and beneficiaries who left the plan because they reached the previous applicable, applicable lifetime limit. And the patient protection notice, which is a notice on patient protections regarding the right to select primary care providers, including pediatric care providers from any provider participated in the plan's network. The notice must also provide that a referral is not required for OBGYN care provided by a, participa a participating physician in the network. Generally, the distribution requirements for these notices were satisfied by including the notices in the open enrollment materials. Also, employers can include the information in their SPDs or an SMM, Summary of Material Modification, or with other employee communications. If you have not sent out or unsure if you've sent out these required notices, you are again urged to contact ERISA Council. Next slide, please. To temporarily avoid some of PAPACA's compliance rules, many employers are desperately holding on to grandfathered status. But the question that should be asked at this time is, does it make sense to continue to be grandfathered? Grandfathered status applies to plans in existence on March 23, 2010. It can be lost by increasing cost sharing by more than specified amounts, by decreasing the percentage of employer contributions, 
and or by decreasing annual limits. The question is, the relevant question is, what are you really gaining by maintaining grandfathered status and is it worth it? To make this determination, you should first take a look at your current health care cost increases with a view as to whether a change such as additional cost sharing will cause a loss of grandfathered status. Then you should compare the amount you would gain by this cost sharing with the cost of the additional rules that your plan would become subject to on loss of grandfathered status. In other words, a quintessential cost-benefit analysis. To do this, you need to examine PAPACA provisions that are and are not applicable to grandfathered plans. Next slide or slide 17, please. PAPACA provisions that are applicable to all plans. Although these are rules that are applicable to all plans, grandfathered or not, there are some small differences. Coverage of adult children, perhaps the most significant change. It will allow children up to the age of 26 to be covered under the parent's plan. Grandfathering allows children who are eligible for another employer's coverage to be excluded from your plan until the year 2014. But when you think about it, these 18 to 26 year olds are probably the healthiest beneficiaries in your plan. So does it really help your health care costs if you exclude them? Restrictions on annual and lifetime benefit limits for essential benefits. Grandfathered plans are permitted to have limited annual maximums through the 2013 year. But these limited maximums are very high. $2 million for plans beginning on and after September 22, 2012 and often, frankly, will not come into play. Elimination of pre-existing condition exclusions for children under the age of 19. This is really rare in group health plans in any event because of PAPACA, and it only applies until 2014 in any event. Therefore, there is not much difference between grandfathered and non-grandfathered plans under these provisions so let's, let's look at other provisions. Next slide or slide 18, please. There are certain PAPACA provisions that are only applicable to non-grandfathered plans as follows. Preventative care services must be provided without cost-sharing requirements under PAPACA. Non-grandfather plans, then, could have some additional expenses. I would suggest you check with your insurer or TPA to get an estimate. It may not be as costly as you might think. Participants may select primary care providers, including pediatric care providers and OBGYNs, from any provider who participates in the plan's network. Now, most plans already permit this. And if the physician is in a network, it will probably do so at no or very little additional cost. Emergency care services must be provided without prior authorization and without regard to whether the emergency care provider is a participating provider. Here again, most plans already permit this, and the rules will only require reimbursement in any event at the in-network rate. Insured group health plans will be subject to non-discrimination rules similar to those currently in effect for self-funded plans. Now this could have a serious problem. This could be a serious problem for a discriminatory plan. It could be a hundred dollar a day penalty for each individual discriminated against. However, the IRS said this rule will not be effective until the final regulations are promulgated. Those of you who have been around a while will remember the old Internal Revenue Code Section 89, which is likely to come back in some iteration. Out-of-pocket maximums. These become effective in 2014, and we will discuss these provisions later. 
but basically it limits the amount a participant must pay by way of co-pays and cost sharing. Depending on your plan's current provisions, this could be a significant cost starting again in 2014. Ten broad categories of essential health benefits. These rules do not apply to large, i.e. over 50, plans or self-funded plans. And finally, maintain an effective internal and external appeals process. This one has caused a lot of concern, so let's look at it separately. Next slide, please, or slide 19. An internal review. Is the review by the group health plans or insurer's own experts upon an appeal of a denied claim? If the plan still denies the claim, under PAPACA, the participant may choose to have an external review by an independent review organization, i.e. an outside independent decision maker, which will decide whether to uphold or to overturn in whole or in part the plan's claim denial. These rules only apply to non-grandfathered plans and have varying effective dates. These plans will be in compliance with the new internal claims and appeals process requirements if they comply with the current claims requirements of the DOL plus six new requirements. These new requirements are, one, an expanded definition of an adverse benefit determination, two, a requirement that urgent care claims be determined and communicated within 72 hours of receipt. Three, a requirement the plan must provide the claimant with any new or additional evidence considered by the plan. Four, that the hiring or compensation of a decision maker must not be based on the likelihood that the decision maker will support a denial of benefits. Five, the plan must issue notices to enrollees in a, quote, culturally and linguistically appropriate manner, unquote. And finally, the plan must continue ongoing treatment pending the outcome of any internal appeal. For most insured plans, the regulations say that the external review requirement will be met if the plan is subject to its insurer to a state-required external review process and or comply with a DOL technical release also applicable to self-funded plans. Next slide, please, or slide number 20. After finishing what I call the first stage of PEPACA compliance, employers were faced with a new set of requirements. Among these were the coordination of HRAs with ordinary group health plans to ensure compliance with the prohibitions of lifetime and annual maximum benefits, reporting the value of group health care coverage on employees forms W-2, creating and distributing the newly required summary of benefits and coverage, SBC, and understanding and complying with the new 60-day advance notice requirement for any material modification in a group health plan. Let's review these requirements one at a time. Next slide, please, or slide 21. As previously discussed, PAPACA generally prohibits group health plans from imposing annual and lifetime dollar limits on essential health benefits. Health reimbursement accounts, or HRAs, are group health plans that typically consist of an employer's agreement to reimburse medical expenses up to a certain dollar amount. Therefore, it is virtually impossible for an HRA to comply with PAPACA's prohibition on annual or lifetime dollar limits. The final rules which implement the prohibition on annual and lifetime dollar limits made a distinction then 
between HRAs that are integrated with other employer health coverage and stand alone. Specifically, the rule provides that when an HRA is integrated with other employer health coverage that by itself and on its own complies with PAPACA's annual and lifetime dollar limit prohibitions, the HRA will not violate PAPACA because the combined benefit satisfies the PAPACA requirements. Next slide, please, or slide 22. W-2 reporting. PAPACA requires employers to include the aggregate cost of employer-provided health care coverage on employees forms W-2. Originally, the effective date of this change was for the taxable year 2011. However, IRS issued guidance delaying the effective date of the reporting requirements until the 2012 tax year, i.e., W-2s that were issued this past January. IRS has also issued additional guidance that includes a delay in the W-2 reporting requirements until further guidance is issued for the following employers. One, employers filing less than 250 W-2s for the previous calendar year. Two, employers sponsoring self-funded plans that are not subject to COBRA, in other words, self-funded church plans, and three, federally recognized Indian tribal governments or tribally chartered corporations wholly owned by federally recognized Indian tribal governments. Next slide, please, or slide 23. Regarding summary of benefits and coverage, or SBC. The material in the summary must include uniform, understandable language and include items such as cost sharing, limitations on coverage, examples of common benefit scenarios, and whether the plan provides the minimum essential health benefits that individuals will need to avoid penalties under PAPACA. The summary can be no longer than four page, and the font can't be smaller than 12 point. The summary must be provided with or in addition to the plan's SPD. The summary can be provided as a standalone document or in combination with other plan materials if it is intact and prominently displayed at the beginning of the materials. Here again, the summary must be provided in a culturally and linguistically appropriate form with a translated summary provided on a request into a different language. The summary can be provided in paper format or electronically if the disclosure complies with DOL rules. Employers that sponsor group health plans must begin distribution of the SBCs on the first day of the first open enrollment period beginning on and after September 23rd 2012. Next slide, please, or slide 24. Now, group health plans and insurers must provide participants and beneficiaries with a summary of benefits and coverage, or SBC, describing the benefits and limitations of the coverage available under the plan. For insured plans, such as HMOs, insurers are required to create the SBC. However, it's the plan administrator, i.e. the plan sponsor, on behalf of group health plans that are responsible for distributing SBCs to plan participants and beneficiaries. For self-funded plans, plan administrators are responsible also for the creation as well as the distribution of SBCs to participants and beneficiaries. Next slide, please, or slide 25. Employers that make mid-year material modifications in any terms of the plan or coverage that is not reflected in the SBC must provide notice of the modification or modifications to enrollees no later than 60 days before the date the modification is to take effect. A material modification is any change that the average participant would find important 
and would affect the content of the SBC. Now, employers are required to comply with the advanced notice requirement for any mid-year changes once the SBC requirement becomes, becomes applicable to the group health plan. However, the notice is not required for changes related to the contract renewal or to the contract reissuance. And again, the 60-day notice can be provided in paper format or pursuant to regulation electronically. Next slide, please, or slide 26. Now, as we are approaching 2014, we are looking at the final stage of PAPACA compliance. In order to be ready for the stage, you need to know about a few things. Essential health benefits, which is the 10 categories of coverage that will be required in the small group marketplace. The 90-day waiting period. Plans may not impose waiting periods of more than 90 days after an employee or a dependent is otherwise eligible. Annual out-of-pocket maximums and deductible limits. This is going to apply to almost all plans. Automatic enrollments in group health plans. Be prepared for required administrative changes in response to upcoming agency regulations here. Health care exchanges. This will allow individuals to purchase insurance coverage on their own without regard to pre-existing health conditions. But if some of your employees receive subsidies because of their purchase of insurance through an exchange, you, the employer, can and likely will be subject to penalties. Individual mandate. Basically, this is the tax penalty imposed on individuals who do not have PAPACA compliant health insurance. Employer mandate. This is often called the pay or play provision in that it basically is a penalty on employers for non-compliance. Next slide, please, or slide 27. As of 2014, which is not so far away, PAPACA requires that non-grandfathered health insurance coverage offered in the individual and small group marketplace, both inside and outside health insurance exchanges, offer a standard package of coverage known as, and I quote, essential health benefits. PAPACA identifies the following 10 broad statutory categories of these so-called EHBs. Ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance abuse disorder services, prescription drugs, rehabilitative services and devices, laboratory services, preventive and wellness services and chronic disease management, and pediatric services, including oral and vision care. Next slide, please, or slide 28. However, PAPACA neither defines the specific benefits required under each category, nor sets a uniform standard for EHBs. In fact, PAPACA requires the Secretary of Health and Human Services to define the specific benefits for each EHB category. Proposed regulations promulgated by the Internal Revenue Service, however, clarify that EHBs will be defined on a state-by-state -state basis using a benchmark approach. Specifically, states may select one of a few of the following plans to serve as states base benchmark. In general, it's the largest health plan by enrollment in any of the three largest small group insurance products, any of the largest three employee health benefit options by enrollment offered and generally available to state employees, etc. After a state selects its base benchmark plan, it will be updated as needed to comply with PAPACA. The resulting plan 
will be known as the state's EHB benchmark plan and used to define EHBs for the state on a going forward basis. Employer sponsored self insurance and insured large group health plans are not required to offer all EHB categories or comply with EHB benchmarks. Only non grandfathered plans insured in the small group market must provide EHBs and conform to EHB benchmark standards. Next slide, please, or slide 29. PAPACA's 90-day waiting period limit, which is effective for plan years beginning on and after January 1, 2014, applies to grandfathered and non-grandfathered group health plans alike. Waiting period is defined as the period of time that must pass before health coverage becomes effective for an employee or a dependent who is otherwise eligible under the terms of the plan. PAPACA mandates that waiting periods based solely on the passage of time cannot extend beyond 90 days. However, plan sponsors may continue to impose substantive eligibility requirements for coverage, such as the attainment of full-time employment. Next slide, please, or slide 30. Beginning in 2014, PAPACA requires non-grandfathered group health plans to ensure that any annual cost sharing imposed by the plans does not exceed certain specified limits, including limits on out-of-pocket maximums and annual deductibles for employer-sponsored plans. For plan year starting in 2014, the out-of-pocket maximum, including both insured and self-insured plans of large and small employers, cannot exceed the self-only and family out-of-pocket maxes applicable to HSA qualified high deductible plans. These amounts will be indexed. The annual out-of-pocket maximum for qualified high deductible health plans for 2013 is $6,250 for self-only coverage and $12,500 for family coverage. The out-of-pocket maximum is the total cost-sharing limit for essential health benefits and includes deductibles, co-insurance, co-pays, or similar charges, and any other required expenditure that is a qualified medical expense but does not include employee premiums. Now, PAPACA's annual deductible limits only apply to non-grandfathered insured plans in the small marketplace. Generally, employers that fall into the group marketplace that is considered small for these purposes is those that have 100 or fewer employees. Other limits are defined as 50 or fewer, so do not get confused. The plan year starting in 2014 now have a maximum deductible under PAPACA that's $2,000 for single and $4,000 per family in a plan year. Again, these amounts are also indexed. Self-insured and large group health plans are not required to satisfy PAPACA's annual deductible limits. Next slide, please, or slide 31. Under PAPACA, employers with 200 employees will be required to automatically enroll new full-time employees in one of their group health plans, giving employees adequate notice and the opportunity to opt out of the plan. Very, very unfortunately, the law does not say when this provision is to be effective. Instead, it requires DOL to set the effective date through regulation. DOL originally intended to issue guidance by 2014. However, DOL recently acknowledged that the guidance likely will not be ready by that time. According to the DOL, employers therefore do not need to comply with auto enrollment until these regulations are promulgated. 
GOL notes that auto enrollment regulations will have a prospective effective date. However, this means that many questions remain quite unanswered. For instance, under these auto enrollment rules, will an employer be responsible for enrolling only the employee or the employee's entire family? If the employer has multiple plan options, can it choose the option in which the employee will be enrolled? What time frames will be involved? And will the coverage have to have retroactive effect to date of hire? Employers should currently be examining the HRIS and benefit systems to see if they are capable of handling automatic enrollment, including the provision allowing the employee to reject auto enrollment. Next slide, please, or slide 32. The Affordable Care Act requires each state to set up its own exchange for the, pur for the purpose of purchasing health insurance coverage. Exchanges are arrangements through which insurers offer employers and individuals the ability to purchase health insurance. Coverage can be purchased through the exchanges beginning in 2014. The law provides the establishment of regional or national exchanges to set standards for what benefits will be covered, how much insurers can charge, and the rules insurers must follow in order to be eligible to offer coverage through the exchanges. Each exchange will offer four metal categories of plans plus a catastrophic plan, including the bronze plan, where we have essential health benefits covering 60% of the cost of the plan, the silver plan, which has essential health benefits covering 70% of plan benefit costs, gold plan with essential health benefits covering 80% of the plan costs, the Platinum Plan covering essential health benefits at 90%, and of course, the Catastrophic Plan, which is available to individuals up to age 30, or to those exempt from the mandate to purchase coverage. Next slide, please, or slide 33. Employers must provide a written notice to each current employee into each newly hired employee that explains the existence of the state's insurance exchange, including a description of the services provided by the exchange and the manner in which the employee may contact the exchange to request assistance. If the employer's plan pays less than 60% of the total allowed cost of benefits provided under the plan, it must also have a statement that the employee may be eligible for a premium tax credit and a cost sharing reduction if the employee purchases a qualified health plan through the exchange. And finally, if the employee purchases a qualified health plan through the exchange, a statement that the employee may lose the contribution to any health plan offered by the employer and that all or a portion of the employer contribution may be excludable from income for federal tax purposes. The health care exchange notice was originally to have been distributed by March 1, 2013, but this requirement has been delayed until later on this summer in order to coordinate distribution efforts with the first open enrollment period for the exchanges. Next slide, please, or slide 34. One of PAPACA's most basic rules is the requirement that individuals have minimum essential health care coverage or face a tax penalty. An individual is considered to have minimum essential health coverage for any month in which he or she is enrolled in one of the following types of coverage employer-sponsored coverage, which would include retiree medical and COBRA, coverage purchased in the individual market, and government-sponsored coverage. Minimum essential coverage does not include specialized coverage for only vision or dental, workers' comp, 
disability policy or coverage for a specific disease or condition like cancer. Next slide, please, slide 35. PAPACA provides certain statutory exemptions from this individual mandate for certain people, such as members of religious organizations that object to coverage on religious principles, members of federally recognized Indian tribes, individuals with incomes below the minimum threshold for filing a tax return, Individuals who have a gap in minimum essential coverage of less than three consecutive calendar months in a year. Individuals who cannot afford coverage because their required contribution toward minimum essential coverage exceeds 8% of their annual income. Individuals who are incarcerated. And individuals who are not lawfully present in the United States. U.S. citizens residing in a foreign country are also generally exempt from the shared responsibilities penalty so long as they meet certain requirements, such as living abroad for the entire calendar year. Next slide, please, or slide 36. Now, there are penalties for non-compliance with the individual mandate for health coverage, and they're determined by calculating the greater of either a flat dollar amount or a set percentage of income. For 2014, the penalty amount is the greater of $95 per adult and $47.50 per child under age 18 to a maximum of $285 per employee per family or 1% of income over a tax filing threshold. For 2015, the penalty amount increases to the greater of $325 or 2% of income over a filing, filing threshold. And for 2016, the penalty amount will increase yet again to the greater of $695 or 2.5% of income over a threshold. After that, the flat dollar penalty will be indexed for inflation. Next slide, please, or slide 37. Beginning in 2014, PPACA's employer shared responsibility provisions require employers with 50 or more full-time equivalent employees to provide affordable health care coverage that offers a minimum level of benefits or coverage or pay a penalty. Employers will determine whether they reach the 50 full-time equivalent threshold by averaging the number of full-time employee equivalents from the calendar months of the previous calendar year. So beginning in 2014, employers with 50 or more employees will be subject to penalties if they fail to offer group health coverage to substantially all of its full-time employees and two, a low-income full-time employee receives a premium tax credit through an exchange. In those situations, the employer must pay an annual penalty of $2,000 multiplied by the number of full-time employees minus 30. An employer is considered to have offered health care coverage to substantially all of its employees if the offer is made to at least 95% of its full-time employees. We're going to be moving now to slide 39, which starts premium tax credits. Thank you. Now, what are premium tax credits? Beginning in 2014, individuals who are enrolled in group health plan coverage purchased through an exchange may be eligible for premium tax credits or a cost-sharing subsidy. The premium tax credit is available to individuals with incomes up to 400% of the federal poverty level. Next slide, please, or slide 40. Under a second penalty provision, 
employers that offer coverage may still be subject to a penalty starting in 2014 if all three of the following conditions apply. The plan either has a value that is less than the minimum value of 60% or a full-time employee's contribution for employee-only coverage exceeds 9.5% of the employee's household income or the employee's household income is less than 100% of the federal poverty line and the employee waives the employer's coverage and purchases coverage on the exchange utilizing premium tax credits. Under PAPACA, an employer-sponsored health plan fails to provide minimum value to its participants and beneficiaries if its share of total allowed cost of benefits is less than 60% of the costs. The IRS has issued proposed regulations offering approved methods for measuring when a plan provides this minimum value. Now the penalty will be calculated separately for each month in which the conditions apply. The amount of the penalty for any given month equals the number of the employer's full-time employees who receive a premium tax credit for that month. However, this penalty is capped at $3,000 multiplied by the number of full-time employees in minus 30. Next slide, please, or slide 41. For purposes of the second penalty, coverage is considered unaffordable if the employee's share of the premium costs more than 9.5% of his or her annual household income. However, employers generally do not know their employees' household income. To address this uncertainty, the IRS has issued guidance which provides the following affordability safe harbors that employers can rely on. The W-2 safe harbor, if the employee's contribution for single coverage under the employer's lowest cost medical option does not exceed 9.5% of the employee's box one W-2 pay for that year, then the affordability test would be satisfied. The rate of pay safe harbor, if the employee's monthly contribution for single coverage under the employer's lowest cost medical option does not exceed 9.5% of the employee's monthly wage amount, the affordability test will be satisfied. And finally, the federal poverty line safe harbor. If the employee's contribution for single coverage under the employer's lowest cost medical option does not exceed 9.5% of the federal poverty line for a single individual, the affordability test would be satisfied. Next slide, please. Slide 42. So in conclusion, as 2014 nears, employers really must continue the implementation of PAPACA's various reforms and coverage mandates. Many of the new provisions for employers and their group health plans have already taken effect, but many, many more requirements and penalties are still on the horizon. So employers really must continue preparations to ensure that they are ready to comply with the new law. By now, you should have assessed and determined if you have, if you have the required plan amendments in place and modifications have been implemented. You should have previously determined whether you are afforded protection under the grandfather status rules. Now you must determine if you want to continue to be grandfathered. You should assess your group health plan to determine if your insurers or your TPA are in compliance with a new summary of benefits and coverage rules as well as PAPACA's claims procedures. And employee communication materials must be written to inform participants of these upcoming provisions of PAPACA and ERISA pursuant to a RAP plan and a RAP SPD. Finally, keep alert. The government will be issuing new rules based on employers and insurers' comments. PAPACA compliance will remain a moving target for the foreseeable future, and the only way to ensure compliance is to remain up to date on all matters affecting your group health plan. We at the Wagner Law Group are here to help you 
in this goal of compliance and are honored and look forward to do so. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you, Marcia. That was really interesting. And thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. A recording will be available on the Wagner Law Group website shortly. And please feel free to contact Marcia if you have any questions. Thank you very much.